Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 127, Space Shuttle Flight 55, STS-55. Fluids in, fluids out. Last time, we talked about STS-56, which saw the second flight of the Atlas payload. We studied the upper atmosphere, the sun, the earth, and how many attitude maneuvers you could ask the pilot crew to do in a day before they decide to hide in the airlock. The time-sensitive mission actually cut in line, launching ahead of the mission we'll be talking about today, STS-55. But by doing so, it was able to perform similar experiments at a similar time of year as the previous Atlas experiment, so the schedule reshuffle was well justified. STS-55 is also known as D-2, since for the second time, Germany has bought itself a space shuttle flight. For D-1, we have to go all the way back to STS-61A, which flew in 1985, and which we covered in episode 89. It may be Germany to us, but it's Deutschland to them, hence the D in D-2. Just like some flights we've seen for Europe and Japan, these D missions saw the government of Germany footing the bill in order to fly a suite of instruments, along with a couple of payload specialists. But STS-61A and STS-55 take things one step further, since both these missions had their payload operations controlled from Germany rather than the United States. I haven't read ahead through the entire shuttle program yet, but I'd be willing to bet that these are the only two flights where this happened, so that makes this mission pretty special. D-2 was originally slated to fly sometime near the end of the 1980s, but like so many other missions, it was pushed around the schedule in the aftermath of the Challenger accident. Because of this, it's been eight years since the previous German mission, and a lot has changed in the world. The Soviet Union broke up, but West Germany and East Germany got back together, making this a reunified German flight. But that reunification process was expensive and ongoing, and space flights were also pretty expensive, so there were plenty of questions being raised about the need for this pricey flight. A possible D-3 mission had already been cancelled in the name of day-to-day practical politics, so there was a lot of pressure for this flight to squeeze as much science as possible out of its nearly 90 experiments. The pressure was further amplified since in an effort to cut costs, Germany had sold some of the mission's capability back to NASA, ESA, and Japan. ESA was flying 21 experiments, NASA was flying 3, and Japan was flying a weirdly vague quote-unquote number of experiments. I say that this amplified the pressure because despite giving up this space on the mission, Germany didn't really want to give up on their original goals either so they kept trying to squeeze more and more into the mission space that they did have. It's understandable, but at some point our payload commander, who we'll meet in a minute, had to put his foot down. Oh well, even with that restraint, there will still be more than enough to keep our crew working hard for the entire flight. So let's meet that crew. Commanding the mission is our old buddy Steve Nagel, flying for the fourth and final time. We saw Nagel flying most recently as the commander of STS-37, which deployed the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. But more relevant to today, his second flight was as pilot on STS-61A, the D-1 mission. I guess the Germans liked him because here he is again on his last mission. Joining Nagel up front is our pilot for today's flight, Tom Henricks. This is Tom's second of four flights, and the last time we saw him, he was flying as pilot on STS-44, which deployed a communication satellite for the Department of Defense. In the back right of the flight deck, we find Mission Specialist 1 and our payload commander, Jerry Ross. We're more used to seeing Ross tooling around the payload bay in an extravehicular mobility unit, like on his previous flight, STS-37. But I guess astronaut boss Dan Brandenstein was impressed by his organizational skills, because he asked Ross to take on the challenging task of wrangling the payload crew, dozens of experiments, and hundreds of scientists, all spread across two continents. Don't worry, our pal Jerry will get plenty more chances to go walking on sunshine, since this is only his fourth of seven flights. Moving to the left, we find Mission Specialist 2, and our first of four rookies for this mission, Charles Precourt. Charles Precourt was born on June 29, 1955 in Waltham, Massachusetts, but grew up in nearby Hudson, Massachusetts. Precourt holds a Bachelor's in Aeronautical Engineering from the Air Force Academy, a Master's in Engineering Management from Golden Gate University, and a Master's in National Security Affairs and Strategic Studies from the U.S. Naval War College. 
Along with all of that learning on the ground, he also did a lot of learning in airplanes as part of his Air Force career, flying the T-37, T-38, F-15, F-15E, F-4, A-7, and A-37. He was selected as an astronaut in January of 1990, and this is his first of four flights. Similar to Ken Cockrail on STS-56, Precourt is destined to fly at the front of the cockpit on upcoming flights, but for today's mission, he will be a mission specialist serving as part of the orbiter crew and helping out the pilot crew while the payload crew does their thing in the back. It's a lot of overlapping crews. Moving down to the mid-deck, we find Mission Specialist 3, Bernard Harris. Bernard Harris was born on June 26, 1956, in Temple, Texas. Harris is coming to us from a medical background, having earned a bachelor's in biology from the University of Houston and a doctorate in medicine from Texas Tech University School of Medicine. From there, he went on to a residency at the Mayo Clinic before a fellowship at NASA Ames and flight surgeon training at the Aerospace School of Medicine at Brooks Air Force Base in Texas. He didn't stop when he became an astronaut either, picking up a master's in biomedical science a few years after this flight. Among other research topics, Harris studied disuse osteoporosis, making him the perfect guy to study the deleterious effects of spaceflight. This is his first of two flights. Rounding out the crew, we have a couple of payload specialists flying with German flags on their arms. This is the part of the show where I can no longer avoid saying German words. I actually apparently have a few listeners from Germany who have been gracious enough to wave off my atrocious pronunciation of their language. One optimistic person even wrote in a few tips. Instead, I'm just going to sort of steer into the skid and go for it. So with that, let's introduce payload specialist one, Ulrich Walter. Ulrich Walter was born on February 9th, 1954 in Iserlohn, Germany. In the early 1970s, he served with the German army before attending the University at Cologne to study physics, earning his doctorate in solid-state physics in 1985. He was nominated as a German science astronaut in 1987 and was assigned to this flight in 1990. This is his first and only flight. And finally, payload specialist 2, Hans Schlegel. Hans Schlegel was born on August 3, 1951 in Überlingen, Germany, but considers his hometown to be a place that seems to be pronounced Aachen. Like Ulrich Walter, Schlegel served in the Federal Armed Forces for a few years in the early 1970s, specifically as a paratrooper. For seven years, he worked as an experimental solid-state physicist at the... Oh, come on. The Rheinisch Westfleisch... You know what? The RWTH at the University of Aachen. <laughs> While there, he studied electronic transport properties and optical properties of semiconductors. After that, he studied non-destructive testing methodology at, well, a different place. If you really want to know, you can email me and try to pronounce it yourself. Schlegel underwent the same training as his fellow payload specialist, but unlike Ulrich Walter, this is not Hans Schlegel's only spaceflight. He was a backup to the German-Russian Mir mission in 1997 and joined the ESA Astronaut Corps in 1998 before finally flying again on STS-122 in July of 2006. So see you in a while, Hans. STS-55 found itself plagued by problems that kept it firmly rooted to the ground. It was originally scheduled to launch in February of 1993, but a question arose about a specific component in the high-pressure oxygen turbopumps of the main engines. If this component was of the older type, it needed to be replaced, but if it was a newer version, it was fine. The thing was, they just couldn't figure out which one it was. Somehow the paperwork was inconclusive, and NASA managers were left with only one option, opening up the engines and checking on the component. Once they finally cracked the engines open and checked, it turned out that they were the newer components and everything was fine, but it was still sort of a goofy procedural error to make. With the turbo pumps secure, STS-55 was set to launch on March 22nd, and the main engines started to ignite until they were shut down at the T-3 second mark. Somewhere in all the twists and turns of the mechanical dream slash nightmare that is the space shuttle main engine, a check valve leaked a little bit, and the shuttle computers did not like the look of it and ground everything to a halt. This was only the third pad abort of the shuttle program so far, and the first since STS-51F, way back in July of 1985. 
The problem resulted in the decision to replace all three main engines, which meant another lengthy delay. An increasingly impatient space shuttle Discovery then cut in line so that it could complete STS-56. On April 24th, the countdown was once again underway when a new problem was discovered. Hours before the crew were ever even driven out to the pad, ground personnel noticed that one of Columbia's inertial measurement units had started to malfunction. This cost the flight another couple of days on the ground as they replaced it, but it was perhaps a blessing in disguise. You can just ask pilot Tom Hendricks. On his first flight, STS-44, this same type of component failed while on orbit, forcing the mission to end several days early. Since STS-44's primary mission was to deploy a satellite, this was kind of no big deal. But for a science mission like today, you really wanted every last bit of time you could get on orbit. So it was really lucky that this component failed on the ground. At long last, however, on April 26th, 1993, at 10.50 a.m. local time, Space Shuttle Columbia rose into the sky for the 14th time, and STS-55 was underway. Ascent was uneventful as Columbia swiveled its engines into a 300-kilometer orbit with a 28-degree inclination. With no need to push into higher inclinations, this mission would not be going any further north than Florida. Right after main engine cutoff, there was a usual flurry of activity. Both payload specialists had special catheters removed from their arms, where instruments had been inserted before liftoff in order to study how their hearts reacted to the ride uphill. Payload Commander Jerry Ross removed the protective covers from the flight deck windows and was momentarily flummoxed to see a man in a spacesuit staring back at him through the window. Presumably moments after the adrenaline kicked in, he recognized the man as himself. It seems that Commander Nagel had coordinated with the ground technicians to play a little prank on his STS-37 crewmate. On that flight, while on an EVA, Ross had made its way to the aft windows to peer inside and wave, resulting in a fun photo. Nagel, aware that it was Ross's job to remove the window covers, had the photo printed at full scale and hidden behind the covers on the flight deck. He then proceeded to forget all about it until he wondered why Jerry Ross was laughing hysterically. Oh, those astronaut pranksters. A gut-busting laugh sounds like a good way to start a mission to me, and only four and a half hours into the flight, Space Lab was open for business. The crew split into two teams, as is usual for Space Lab flights, with Commander Nagel, Pilot Henricks, Payload Commander Ross, and Payload Specialist Walter taking the blue shift, and Mission Specialist Harris, Mission Specialist Precourt, and Payload Specialist Schlegel taking the red shift. Also, please try saying Payload Specialist Schlegel three times fast. As I mentioned, this flight is carrying a lot of experiments, so we're just going to do our usual quick tour. And also, as usual, I don't mean to downplay the science when I do this. It's just that there are a ton of experiments that require some real expertise even to understand, let alone perform. Experiments with names like cellular dendritic solidification at low rate of aluminum lithium alloys. And we've only got so much time together, I don't want to let this get too dry. If you're ever interested in really digging in and reading about all these experiments on a mission, they're all right there in the mission press kit. You can email me at jp at thespaceabove.us and I can help you find them. Anyway, on to the science. Way in the back of the payload bay, mounted on a specialized structure called the Unique Support Structure, were some unpressurized experiments that basically minded their own business with no real crew involvement. We've got a few Earth-observing instruments, a wide-angle camera that's going to take pictures of the entire galaxy in a few different ultraviolet wavelengths, and another batch of over 200 material samples to be exposed to atomic oxygen. In front of the unique support structure, we find our home away from home, the pressurized Space Lab module. As usual, this shuttle-based laboratory is completely packed with as much scientific equipment as the science teams on the ground could get away with. Today's flight has more of a focus on life science than D1 did, which focused primarily on material science, but we've still got some material science going on. Inside the Material Sciences Experiment Double Rack for Experiment Modules and Apparatus, which is somehow shortened to media, there were three specialized instruments. The elliptical mirror furnace performed long-term crystallization experiments, According to the press kit, the gradient furnace studied direct solidification methods using metallic crystals grown at high temperatures. I say according to the press kit because I have no idea what that means, so I'm just repeating it. 
And lastly, the high precision thermostat is basically what it sounds like, and we'll be studying the behavior of metals at very precise temperatures. Continuing with material science, we have the Workstoff Labor Material Sciences Laboratory, which is thankfully shortened to WL. Here, the payload crew would be using five different furnaces, a fluid physics module, and a crystal growth module. This is the equipment that will be performing that solidification experiment that I mentioned earlier. Among other things, the crew would be studying the possibility of making single crystal turbine blades. If a turbine blade could be made with just one large metallic crystal, instead of an amalgamation of a bunch of different crystals, as is typical with metal, then the blades would be incredibly strong and tough. These days, I know that these exist, and you don't see them being manufactured in space, so I guess they figured out how to make them on the ground. But I'm betting that today's research helped. Moving along, we find the Holographic Optics Laboratory, or HOLOP. Here we find experiments with names like Interferometric Determination of the Differential Interdiffusion Coefficient of Binary Molten Salts. Yeah. The crew would be using holography to study processes like heat and mass transfer, which are important for advanced metallurgy. I'm not fully sure how holography was involved, but just based on my limited knowledge of holograms, I would guess that they were using lasers and interference patterns to reveal aspects of these experiments that would be invisible to a normal camera. Next on our tour is the Barrow Reflex Experiment. You may not realize it, but for most people on Earth, the human body does something pretty incredible, in less than a second, without even having to think about it. When you stand up, the blood that was in your head wants to go down into your body, partially due to gravity and partially just due to inertia. This would make you quickly lose consciousness, so buried in your neck are special receptors that detect this change in blood pressure and rapidly respond to it. These baroreceptors tell your heart to pump faster, increasing the blood pressure, and ensuring that your head doesn't just empty out, and you can now continue to enjoy consciousness. If you've ever sat around literally all day long, say playing Kerbal Space Program, certainly nothing I've ever done, and then were to suddenly stand up, you might feel a little lightheaded at first. That's the kind of phenomenon that your baroreflex is trying to fight. When astronauts come home from extended stays in space, it's not uncommon for this reflex to have gotten a little rusty. So they stand up, and they immediately fall back down. There's even a few videos of this online. It's sort of scary to watch, but it's actually pretty harmless as long as they don't hit anything on the way down. Once the astronaut faints, their head is lower, the blood rushes back in, and they regain consciousness. It's just a nuisance. Unless you're trying to land the space shuttle. As we've touched on numerous times at this point, the shuttle is unique because the pilot crew gets one and only one shot at landing the orbiter, with precision, on a runway. And for that, they need all their blood to be exactly where it's supposed to be. So studying why this reflex gets rusty, and maybe finding a way to sharpen it, was a priority for NASA. The experiment looked sort of like those braces that EMTs will put around your neck if you've been involved in an accident but with a form-fitting rubber sleeve and a big hose coming out of it. It does not look pleasant. The experiment was able to monitor the wearer's blood pressure and pulse, and by gentle application of pressure and suction could stimulate the baroreceptors. Heart monitors can then track the response of the body. By doing this in a methodical way, scientists could reverse engineer how the system works and hopefully gain insight into how to make it work better in space and on the ground. Neat. If you thought the Barrow Reflex experiment sounded unpleasant, wait until you hear about this next one. The Anthrorack. Not the Agrocrag, the Anthrorack. Here we find 20 different experiments designed to figure out just what's going on inside a human body in space. Ah, now the name makes sense. Anthro meaning man, and rack meaning... I guess meaning rack. <laughs> it's equipment dedicated to studying humans. They'd be testing how breathing patterns change, tracking the movement of organs, and yes, they do move around, and drawing a lot of blood. In fact, one crew member said that if you added up the baseline measurements before the flight, the flight itself, and the samples taken after the flight, individual crew members lost as much as a liter of blood. But hey, sacrifices must be made in the name of science. One notable contribution of the anthrorack to spaceflight history was the first ever intravenous line set up in space. Let's take a step back. Human bodies are used to walking around upright on Earth, fighting the force of gravity to get fluids to stay in the upper body. 
When you arrive in space, suddenly that force is essentially gone. The result is that a whole bunch of fluid moves from the lower body to the upper body, resulting in conditions with the highly technical names chicken legs and moon face. <laughs> your legs slim down and your head gets all puffy. This is fine, except that your body notices all this extra fluid in your head, and since it expects you to be in gravity, it assumes that you must have a ton of extra fluid in your entire body. So, during the first few days in space, you lose something like 2 liters of fluid as your body tries to fix the perceived problem. Of course, when you come back to Earth, gravity starts pulling things down again, and we've got the same problem we had with the barrow reflex. Not enough blood and fluids in your upper body, resulting in lightheadedness and fainting. So, the scientists reasoned, why not just put some fluid back? And that's why, for one experiment, mission specialist Bernard Harris, a medical doctor, slipped a needle into the arm of payload specialist Ulrich Walter and began infusing him with a saline solution. Two liters of it. The entire payload crew would eventually undergo this treatment. Harris said that the feeling reminded him of arriving on orbit in the first place, with the characteristic puffy head. The only problem is it seems that the body just sort of did its thing again and the fluids were soon disposed of. Oh well. Thanks to the numerous experiments dedicated to studying the human body's adaptation to space, the scientific community was able to learn a great deal about space adaptation syndrome, as well as how aspects of the human body work in general. Dr. Harris said that it was his belief that our understanding of space adaptation syndrome was settling into three phases. In the acute phase, you get the nausea and the puffy head that we were just discussing. In the intermediate phase, you start to see cardiovascular changes, like the barrow reflex desensitization. And in the long term, you start to see muscle and bone loss. Each phase was important for its own reason, and STS-55's contributions to this ongoing research were one more piece in the puzzle. One more experiment I'll bring up is ROTEX, which seems to stand for Robotic Technology Experiment. This was a robot arm with six joints that was designed to run through some pre-programmed routines, as well as be controlled from the orbiter or from the ground. By using stereoscopic cameras, crew members or ground engineers could see through the eyes of the robot, and practice tasks like assembling small structures and grabbing floating objects. Grabbing an object is a pretty natural motion for most people on Earth. But when that object is weightless, and you're controlling a robot arm with no tactile sensations, it's a pretty tricky thing to do. Even the crew members who had the benefit of operating the robot arm with no communications delay had a few issues at first before they got the hang of it. But with a little practice, even the folks on the ground with a 4 second delay were eventually able to accomplish the task. Robot arms like this will almost certainly play an extensive role in the future of spaceflight. An interior arm on a space station would provide a sort of virtual extra crew member. A dexterous exterior arm could, and does, allow a space crew to accomplish tasks outside without the risk of an EVA. And of course, the arm caught my eye because, as one source put it, quote, the arms could provide assistance in rendezvous and docking, assembly, repair, and manufacturing processes, unquote. And that may as well be a description of OSAM-1, the mission I'm working on at NASA Goddard, with OSAM being short for On-Orbit Servicing, Assembly, and Manufacturing. And just to really emphasize the utility of robot arms in space, OSAM has three of them. We're just bristling with arms. We're really going to have to keep an eye out for Magnus Burnsides. And if that joke made any sense to you, then I'm very happy. Not everything on this flight was nice, smooth science operations. In addition to faultlessly operating a $2 billion engineering marvel, a lot of what astronauts train for is just basic plumbing. The shuttle orbiter had a lot of different fluids that needed to get from point A to point B, and it was inevitable that the systems that enabled that run into a problem every now and then. So it wasn't a huge surprise when on flight day 2, the waste collection system stopped working. When a crew member uses the waste collection system, aka space toilet, the resulting fluid is collected in the waste water tank. Inside this tank is a bellows, or a membrane. Nitrogen is pumped into the space between the tank and the bellows, and the fluid inside is then pushed out of the waste water valve and dumped overboard. The problem today is that a puncture has appeared in the side of the waste water tank. Thankfully for everybody involved, the puncture was with the outer part of the tank, not the membrane inside. But the result was that when nitrogen was pumped into the tank, instead of pushing the membrane, which squeezed the wastewater out, 
the nitrogen just sort of leaked out into the cabin, which isn't great. Commander Nagel and Pilot Henricks pulled up the floorboards, more or less literally, and began crawling around underneath the floor of the middeck. Once down there, they were able to redirect the wastewater into rubber-lined bags that were carried for this exact contingency. The repair was fairly simple, and in the end, the only thing that leaked was some nice clean nitrogen, so that's not so bad, except... <laughs> have you seen it yet? Have you seen what the problem is? If the wastewater has been redirected to these bags, what squeezes the bags for overboard dumps? Well, you do. Well, not you, the crew does. I have to wonder if the crew members that caught this dubious chore floating in the darkness under the shuttle floor, squeezing a bag of wastewater, had expected this when signing up to be astronauts. Again, this was a relatively simple problem, but it came with a catch. Since the nitrogen pressurant had to be disabled in the wastewater tank, it also disabled it in the potable water tanks, which meant that they couldn't easily get water for food or drink out of the galley. So, Nagel and Henricks went back downstairs and connected a valve to the wastewater tank, so now they could turn off just that one tank and restore pressure to the others. Easy peasy. Except their job as surprise weightless plumbers wasn't quite complete. With all the life sciences work going on in the back of the orbiter, there were a lot of samples being generated that needed to be frozen or refrigerated. The orbiter carried a fridge specifically for this task, which instead of just being called a refrigerator, is called the Orbiter Refrigerator Slash Freezer, which was, of course, shortened to ORF. Gotta have an acronym. <laughs> Payload Commander Jerry Ross had looked at the science manifest and at just how important access to refrigeration was. Then he looked at previous flights and saw that it wasn't uncommon to lose a fridge, an ORF, to some mechanical fault during the mission. So he successfully pushed for a backup ORF to be carried, just in case. Sure enough, during ascent, the primary fridge failed and never quite got working again. The ground came up with a complex repair process, which went through 12 iterations on the ground before being sent up to the crew. Once again, Commander Nagel and Pilot Hendricks put on their plumber hats and meticulously worked through the three-hour, 41-step process, but to no avail. The first fridge never did work properly, so it is a very good thing that Jerry Ross talked them into bringing a second one. Overall, the mission chugged along fairly smoothly, with the plumbing and fridge issues easily being the biggest anomalies. One small incident did jump out at me, though. On flight day 8, the ground configured the KU band communications for a Tedris handover. I'm a little bit iffy on the specifics here, but I believe they basically told the orbiter's KU band system, the system used to communicate with Tedris, to shut down, in anticipation of a gap between Tedris satellites. I'm not sure why they would do this, but maybe to prevent an unnecessary alarm when communications quote-unquote unexpectedly dropped. Anyway, the system was told to turn off, wait for the handover, and then turn back on. Except, the stored procedure did not actually tell the KU band communications to turn back on. It told it to go into standby mode. What resulted was around 80 minutes of no communication between the ground and Columbia, until somebody on board finally noticed and turned the communications back on. Bugs in stored procedures can be pretty scary, but the reason that this really caught my eye is I can think of another space mission where the crew unexpectedly failed to communicate with the ground for an entire orbit, Skylab 4. I guess I can just be glad that nobody's talking about the STS-55 mutiny. Well, except for me just now. Oh god, is this how it starts? Let's just move on. Some communications equipment that wasn't having trouble was one of my personal favorites, the Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment, or SAREX. Joining SAREX today was another amateur radio brought by the German crew members called SAFEX. The name of the experiment, which seemed at first glance to be called the Space Lab Amateur Funk Experiment, got a confused laugh out of me at first. But then I thought it through and checked a German dictionary, and sure enough, Funk is the German word for radio. And here I was thinking that we're going to start doing some non-professional dancing. As usual, SAREX and SAFEX were used to communicate with a bunch of different schools on the ground, as well as a few lucky ham radio operators who managed to catch Columbia sailing through their skies. 
In an oral history, Commander Nagel mentioned how he nearly set himself up for a big public relations faux pas. Before the mission, an employee at the Kennedy Space Center had asked Nagel if he would talk to a school nearby in Florida. Nagel replied that, yeah, if he had time, sure. When the time arrived on orbit, it turns out that he was indeed free, and he had a nice chat with the school, no big deal. Except that this was not one of the officially planned school chats, and had not been added to the schedule as an important event. In Nagel's mind, this was just a nice little thing that he'd do if he found himself with a free moment. But in everyone else's mind, this was a big deal with a capital B, capital D. He found out later that tons of people gathered to hear the radio call, and it was even on the local news. If he had disappointed the local school children through a simple misunderstanding, it would have been sure to cast himself and NASA in a negative light. So I guess, just let that be a reminder that if you're ever on a high-profile space mission, please let the public relations people do their jobs while you handle the space stuff. Also, real quick, I missed this on Nagel's previous flight, STS-37, but I found this little anecdote when reading for this episode, and it's too good to pass up. Before that flight, he set his friend up with a small handheld amateur radio and told him what time to be ready for a call. The friend just happened to find himself in the parking lot of a grocery store when the time came, so while standing there with his groceries, he had a brief little chat with his friend flying overhead. Another customer had been nearby and asked who the guy had been talking to. All Nagel's friend could do was laugh and say, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. On flight day 7, the scrupulous use of onboard supplies was rewarded with an extra day added to the end of the mission. As I mentioned earlier, this was a much bigger deal for a space lab mission since it meant that significantly more science could get done. Though I have to wonder what Jerry Ross thought. He later said that part of his job as payload commander was ensuring strong communication during handoffs between the two shifts, and making sure that everyone was getting to bed on time so they didn't overstress themselves. Unfortunately, nobody was doing that for him. By his estimate, he only got around five hours of sleep every night for the entire mission. In fact, at the time, he said that this was the only mission where at the end of the flight, he was actually ready to come home. If an astronaut is ready to come back to Earth, you know they must be exhausted. Well, good news, Jerry. When flight day 10 rolled around, the weather at the Kennedy Space Center was once again not good enough for landing, and even though there were enough resources to go for an extra day, Mission Control immediately called for a landing at Edwards on the next rev. Why not wait the extra day? Well, Commander Nagel's theory was that Germany was starting to get a little bit worried about having all of their proverbial eggs in one basket. With the primary freezer broken, a huge swath of the mission depended on the one freezer that still worked. If it failed on that last day, they would lose a ton of science. So, the crew stayed strapped in, the commander and pilot updated the computer, and one rev and one uneventful re-entry later, Columbia rolled to a stop at Edwards Air Force Base. The mission added 9 days, 23 hours, 39 minutes, and 59 seconds to the total flight time of the orbiter fleet, which, with this mission, now topped a full year. Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavor had chalked up an entire year on orbit. Time really flies, doesn't it? To me, these space lab flights are starting to look more and more like compressed versions of what the International Space Station does today. Even when Germany isn't footing the bill, it's not uncommon to have a wide range of experiments from several different countries. And you're definitely seeing the core members of the ISS starting to come together, especially once we get to the upcoming shuttle Mir flights. On a surface level, this flight seems pretty similar to previous space lab missions. But it seems to me that they're becoming more and more refined, extracting more data and handling failures deftly. And these are all skills that are going to be critical in the years to come. And as for the experience of the crew, I'm sure that most astronauts would agree with payload specialist Ulrich Walter and his thoughts on weightlessness. He said, quote, It was more dream than reality. It's damn impressive. Next time, Endeavor is back on the launch pad, and while Space Lab is taking a break, seemingly just to keep future podcasters on their toes, NASA will introduce Space Hab to the shuttle fleet. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. 